You're listening to Dodge Movie Podcast. Your hosts are Christy and Mike Dodge, the founders of Dodge Media Productions. We produce films and podcasts, so this is a podcast about films. Join them as they share their passion for filmmaking. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Dodge Movie Podcast, where we break down the movies that we love. And what better movie today than one that is Mike's (laughs) all-time favorite? Oh, can you hear him squeeing in the background? Yeah, that's me. (laughs) He loves this movie. Okay, it's Pitch Perfect from 2012. And I'm just going to quickly run through some stats and turn it over to him because he knows this movie inside and out. Quotes it all the time. (laughs) Loves this movie. Okay. Directed by Jason Moore, who also did Pitch Perfect 2 and 3 and some TV shows. It stars a whole host of people that I'm not going to get all of, but Anna Kendrick, Brittany Snow, Rebel Wilson, Adam Devine, Ben Platt. Anna Camp. Anna Camp. Skylar Aston. Oh, so many. Look it up. Mm-hmm. The writer is Kay Cannon and Mickey Rapkin. I believe that Mickey gets the credit from the book that it's based on. I think Kay was the screenwriter. That sounds correct. The synopsis is Becca, a freshman at Barden University, is cajoled into joining the Bellas, her school's all-girl singing group. Injecting some much-needed energy into their repertoire, the Bellas take on their male rivals in a campus competition. The tagline for this film is, get pitch slapped. <laughs> See how they did that. And I will just say that this movie drops you in the middle of the action at a competition. Mike, what's the pickup line? Please don't stop the music. Isn't that perfect? It's actually sung. But please don't stop the music is appropriate because this film is about music. And right out of the gate, I'm going to say we talked a little bit in a previous episode about what constitutes a musical. And I would argue that technically this film could be considered not a musical because they're just covering pop songs and it's not used to deliver dialogue. However, I believe to the lay person, there's so much music in this film, it qualifies as a musical. Yes. It was, like Mike said, one of our roommates who believed it was not a musical. So one of my pet peeves is talking over the dialogue. In a, I'm sorry, what did you say? Oh, perfectly done. And I'm one of those people that, look, some guy sat in his underpants and, and typed that out in the middle of the night. He worked really hard on that dialogue. You, you owe it to him. And so one night, Christy and her mom were having a conversation while Pitch Perfect was on. And her mom stopped at one point and says, why isn't he getting mad at us for talking over this? And I said, it's because I know this movie. I don't need to hear what's going on to know the dialogue and the lyrics. This is not my... One favorite film. This is one of my favorite films. I don't know if I could pick a single child that I love the most. It's like children. You can't pick one. Right. But this is definitely one of my favorite films. And I would not have predicted it going into it, which in retrospect is stupid. I should have been able to say I would love this film. It's a film about a bunch of strong, powerful women who are singing and who discover their new power in life. But it's a romantic comedy. So... When you stop and look at the structure of this film, Becca goes through the classic transformation. Love transforms her, right? Her conflict with Jesse is what causes her to become a better person is a classic rom-com. And instead of having the guy be the lead that has the problem and the girl be the flippy TJ, but it's the other way around. So it totally hits my gender swap rom-com itch. Like this is the film that probably inspired me to the lofty heights I am today. But this film is... In retrospect, we we think it obvious, but at the time it came out, a cappella collegiate singing was not a big deal. And this was a bit of a surprise hit. And so, yeah, yeah, they were having these competitions because in the movie, oh, yeah. didn't they use groups from other collegiate? Yes, it did exist, but not in the public's mind, right? Okay. And so, in fact, Kelly Jackal, one of the Bellas, was in a group at USC that won, I think, two of these competitions. And one of the crew, like the music director or something, was in this group at the same time. So I, they definitely existed, but nobody really knew about it. It was a fairly narrow subject. So like, for example, On the Rocks is coming to Portland in in December to do a Christmas show. And they wouldn't have been able to sell tickets before this movie, you're saying? I don't think so. Straight No Chaser is another oh, maybe acapella that's group. Coming. Yeah, that's uh, just my, my remembrance of this. When the book came out, this was based on it. Was, it's fun that they talk about how they're such dorks. And so they have something like, oh, synchronized nerd singing. How cool. 
<laughs> right. And they actually kind of hang a lampshade on that in the film. In the opening scene where they're at the college, they show, you know, the typical campus where you're trying to get everybody to join your clubs and they have the different singing groups on campus. And some of the other characters are referring to it in less than swimming terms. And so what I find also grandly ironic about this is there's a character named Benji played by Ben Platt who is a superstar known for Dear Evan Hansen. And at the time that this film was made, he hadn't even been in Book of Mormon. I think he had maybe been cast. It was overlapping a little bit with Book of Mormon. I think maybe he filmed the movie before, and then it came out when Book of Mormon was going. He plays this person that is not good enough to be (laughs) in a vocal group, which I love the grand irony of that. And his character at one point says, performing live gives me such a rush. So grand irony, right? Mm -hmm. We see this story and it has kind of some of the classic tropes of the movies, right? That you have this band of characters who are lumped together through- The Misfits. The Misfits, Dirty Dozen, Mm -hmm. classic. And they have the training montage, right? Right, right. You see they go through the process and they're trying to find their way and there's the power struggle within the group. Beck is this very broody person and she's trying to get this career as a DJ, but her dad, who is played- by John Hickey. That was one of the times we had to pause because I had to prove to Mike that I was a huge John Hickey fan. Yeah. It's trying like I think all parents to get her to engage. She's a little bitter. The parents got divorced. She's having a hard time with it. We see this character who is finding something that she didn't think was her passion be a way for her to find friends. You know, you, you beautiful weirdos, that kind of thing. So in some sense, it's a common kind of motif. But what I think is really brilliant about this was this milieu of acapella cover songs. We talk about in filmmaking, one of the things that drives sequels is the recognizability to get people in. And in retrospect, this was brilliant because they sing medleys of songs that people know. The next film up in our queue was all original songs Mm -hmm. that we learned and now we know. Mm -hmm. But for Pitch Perfect, they were actually singing songs that people already knew. And if you look, there's common themes throughout it. It's a well-written film, but I think there's that touch point that really surprised all of us that the album went on to sell so many copies because people were drawn to it. It was, you know, recognizable pop songs. And that was kind of subtly brilliant. And so maybe now, you know, Heartless producers will <laughs> will try to use that against us, but I thought that worked out pretty well. So even though this movie is musically driven, was there anything about the cinematography that stood out to you? I mean, you've got the beautiful Anna Kendrick, Anna Camp. I mean, you've got some beautiful people in this, so it's oh, yeah. not hard. But was there any cool, like, um, I don't know, framing or shots that you remember? One thing that I noticed is throughout the film is there's gorgeous catch lights for Anna Kendrick. She's the lead in the film and you take care of the lead, I guess, (laughs) from a lighting perspective. There was a really nice shower curtain reveal that I thought was kind of fun. (laughs) And again, there's this kind of awkwardness in filmmaking when the actors need to be in a situation where they wouldn't have clothes on. And so there is a scene where Brittany and Anna are supposed to be in the shower. So they apparently were in fact naked. Yeah, I was going to share that. I read in the trivia. Yeah. Do you want to? I'm sorry. No, you can go ahead. Give give the trivia. So the trivia says like they were both comfortable with their bodies and they decided to just they didn't put their robes on in between takes. And I thought, OK, they're both comfortable with their bodies. But what about all the crewmen and the union guys <laughs> standing around? <laughs> yeah. Is is Tony down with that? Like, yeah. yeah. Well, I'm sure he. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe not. Uh, uh. But were they cool with all the guys standing around? <laughs> exactly. But I did think that was kind of a fun reveal. And there are some sight gags around the magic that the character of Benji mm-hmm. performs. One of the challenges is shooting people on stage like that, right? So there's stage lighting and then there's film lighting. And I thought they did a very good job of using film lighting to make it look like it was stage lighting. Mm-hmm. Although, like with a lot of films, there's a scene where Becca sees Jesse in the crowd and interacts with him in a way which, as anyone who has been on stage knows, is very difficult when the lights are on because there's all the lights in your eyes. Well, and how many times do they have to do this? Because you have your wide so that you can have no other cameras mm-hmm. in the shot. And then you have all your different close-ups, one of Anna, one of Rebel, one of Anna Camp. So many different angles, then you'd have your, I guess you could do that without them performing, but you would have the Mm -hmm. close up of Skylar in the audience and different things. I mean, they had to perform this 
all these different songs so many right. different times. And in one of the trivia goose, they say that there is a, a scene at the finals at the end of the movie where they, they cut between shots, and in one of the shots they cut to, Anna Camp isn't present, and they cut back and she is. <laughs> and so, I mean, I thought that was as simple as, you know, the actress is like, ah, you know, I have to go to the restroom or I have to take this call. And like nobody, you know, they didn't give a thought about it because there's a dozen people on stage. And you also think of filling the auditorium. With extras? Extras who sit there and watch over and over. The same dang song, over. right? It's not nearly as exciting as it, it probably seems to be. So from that perspective, also one of the comedians that lives in the house rent-free mentioned how costly it would be for the songs, but I actually think it's not too bad because they're just getting the songwriter fees. They're not getting an actual recording. So I could be wrong on that, but I think the cost of licensing the song itself without a particular performance is quite a bit more cost effective, which makes sense because there's a lot of music in the film. We should look that up because I've always been curious. I think maybe I did try to look it up and it is hard to find an actual number because it depends on the song, kind of how its popularity and everything. Mm -hmm. But my thought always, and I just looked it up, this was a Universal Pictures movie. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to look up if Universal Pictures owns any licensing. Oh, yeah, I'm pretty sure they do. Yeah. I've often wondered if you did a movie and your backing was by like Sony or if Universal owns, then do you get like a deal because it's already in their corral of other sure. businesses. Yeah, they can certainly put pressure on the other part of the organization to give you a good deal, I would think. So I would say the driving factor, I would have thought, would have been whether the songs would mash together, including, for example, the riff off. So we're going to take a little bit of a break and mention that apparently empty swimming pools have another purpose besides skateboarding. Great and acoustics. Yeah, I guess so. And so there's these riff off that happen a couple times throughout the film, and they link songs to another based on not just word, but also musically write the notes themselves. I can't do this. I'm not that talented. But one of the Barden Bellas is played by Esther Dean. And we now know Esther for Songland, which is a television show where aspiring songwriters come. And from that, we have learned that she is a prolific songwriter and well-known in the industry. And at the time that I saw her in this film, I had no idea who this person was. And it's funny because during the riff off, she actually sings a song that she wrote. So maybe when you have Esther Dean on set, you say, okay, here's the catalog from Universal. Find me some songs. And she can do that. I don't know. I wonder, she probably can't give license unless... Well, she she's the songwriter. She would be able to probably. But yeah, it depends. I don't know how the rights go, like right. if she did it as a hire. So there's a strong through line of comedy throughout this film. It is a little more slapsticky and raunchy than I remembered. I'll be honest. And one of the trivia that I like is Rebel Wilson and Adam Devine apparently improved the sexual tension between Fat Amy and Bumper. And so eventually they had done such a fun job of it that with the editing, they were able to link that into the story. So I thought that was kind of fun. And that, by the way, spoiler alert, that does come back in Pitch Perfect 2. So they created that whole storyline themselves. Yeah, and I read in the trivia that they would go off on Jags for like 20 minutes and have the whole cast and crew just bust in a gut. So there's also the through line of nerdery. Mm -hmm. It's obviously presaging his time in Dear Evan Hansen, but Ben Platt plays Benji, who's super nerdy. And he has, for example, his half of the dorm room is entirely <laughs> in Star Wars stuff, including a rather prolific collection of action figures, mm -hmm. if one notices. Mm -hmm. And he says, I'm not a total nerd. I also happen to be into close-up magic. <laughs> <laughs> but I think the champion nerddom goes to one of the troublemakers has a unicycle. And when I was at college, there was a unicycling club, and I want to say they knew what they were doing, but just had a bad sense of humor, but they called themselves the Unix. <laughs> and when you're trying to get a girlfriend in college, telling her that you're a Unix is not your best plan. So I could not help but when I saw that guy with the unicycle, think of that. Oh my gosh, it's a Unix. I thought you were going to say every college has one person who rides a unicycle, not one club. <laughs> yes, and they would have a yearly event where they would unicycle to a donut shop, which was miles away. And if you've ever seen someone ride a unicycle, there is no gearing. It's right directly connected to the wheels and they have to pedal furiously to go at even a walking pace. So making it to and from the donut place is quite an accomplishment. And the really pro guys could go up and down stairs. Oh my gosh. Yeah. They're probably also into close-up magic. <laughs> 
there's also just a, a subtle thing here. I mean, this is dating me that I got this joke, but there's a Rick D's callback. Does yes. anybody know who Rick D's is? I do, I do. Okay, and Christy, who is Rick D's? He was, well, let's see. He was a DJ. I was going to say, did he take over for Casey Kasem? But I think they were rivals. They overlapped one another at a time. And he did silly bits. Yes, he had a song, Disco Duck, if memory serves. Mm -hmm. He was, I think, the highest paid DJ at that time down in LA. Fun fact, I met a guy who worked for him, was one of his like in-studio producers. Was he a nice guy? I think he was a douche nozzle, but I don't remember. <sighs> Shoot. Don't remember, but I, th I thought, uh, if I remember correctly, the guy said he was not the, not the easiest boss. Mm. But it was just interesting because that's- In 2012, to reference yeah, the D's. Yeah, but it's her dad saying it, so I think that makes sense. So oh, yeah. tip of the cap to Kay Cannon, the writer, I think a nerdy parent would probably make that callback. Yeah. Well, and also would not, because DJs can make a lot of money if you're, you know, kind of- Oh, yeah. He did. No, but I'm saying like what Becca wants to do. People oh, yeah. Who, yeah. But her dad only sees like a radio DJ. Right. The guy with the booming voice. Yeah. Boomer and the nudge, the morning, mm -hmm. yeah. you know- Rush. Yeah. And I find that ironic because now that person would have a podcast. <laughs> hey, what are you saying? Right. So one of the <laughs> things that apparently is part of collegiate acapella, at least, is puns. So that appeals, I think, a little bit to the dad joke crowd. But there's a real group called the Sockapellas, which is hilarious. And then there's also a reference to a group called the Minstrel Cycles by... <laughs> Elizabeth. Elizabeth Banks and John Michael Higgins play the commentators of these collegiate acapella. And it's very reminiscent to me of Statler and Waldorf and the Muppets. Yes. Very funny. It reminded me of Best in Show. I feel like there were commentator. I mean, I guess it's an event and they have Absolutely. I think it was, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A call back to that. And that's actually part of the humor. And the trivia said that she and he filmed their scenes in one day. So credit to her. And I believe that Ms. Banks directed the second film, if memory I, serves. Yes, I believe you're right. So she did very well. There's a running gag of the Bard Bella who speaks very quietly. Yes, I have all of her lines in front of me if you... Oh, yeah. Why don't you just go ahead and tell us what Lily says? So some of the things that Lily whispers that are virtually inaudible, the only one I got was at the very end. She says it at a decibel above inaudible. And she says, <laughs> I hate my twin in the womb. <laughs> yeah. So apparently she says her name. My name is Lily and I was born with gills like a fish. <laughs> and then she makes the fishy face. Yeah. At the auditions, she said, what happened last year? And do you guys want to see a dead body? She says, I did a stint in county. <laughs> and then in Becca's room after she's released from police custody, she says, I set fires to feel joy. <laughs> so this was 2012. And Becca's roommate is Kimmy Jin, who is a Korean student that we find out because she's hanging out at the Korean Students Association booth. And she comically hates Becca so, so much, which I think resonates to people in college. I think a lot of people had a college roommate who hated them. Well, the, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. I love the set design, too, of her mm -hmm. room being this, like, stark <laughs> white and off-white. Yeah. Just very minimalistic yeah, kind yeah. of look. And then Becca's looks like a normal you know, semi-normal college dorm room. <laughs> right. And there's just that horrible disdain when she comes back and like, oh, you're still here. <laughs> right? That was kind of funny. I want to mention that it's musical and it's comedy. There's a lot of like silly comedy here. Bumper is this over the top, ridiculously, unrealistically optimistic character, right? He's got way more confidence than he really should have. He's obnoxious. Yeah, he kind of is. And the fun story about the audition was Adam Devine from the movie thought it was a baseball film and did <laughs> not come prepared to sing. So I thought that was great. So didn't he sing the theme to Full House? Full House. That's <laughs> correct. When Becca's character shows up to the audition, she's not aware that she's supposed to sing. I think that's fun if that was derived from Adam's performance when he showed up. And if you're curious, you can go on YouTube and see a bunch of making of videos. They did this boot camp where they taught all of the actors who are in the Barden Bellas, and I presume also the Troublemakers, to sing and dance together as if they had been in a group for years. Cool. Was there any cool editing things that you noticed 
like especially after watching the film so many different times sometimes you notice things that you didn't notice the first time i have to say i can't put my finger on it but i think i've gone past the ability to recognize it and now i just see everything coming there was one thing i thought that you saw that was new this time yeah, I wish I made a note of it because now I'm forgetting it. Yeah, I do occasionally see new things as I come through. One thing that I found fascinating was in the music studio for the student radio. I could have swore that the numbers on the door said 85.7, which I don't know is a real frequency that seems awfully low. But in the, in the dialogue, I think they said a different number. But a lot of times don't like college aren't the bands assigned from this one to this one that's cable access and from this one to this one it's college right. radio and from this one to this one it's I like know that network the, radio i know that the fcc assigns those bands i don't know if some are specifically collegiate i think the ones at the ends of the spectrum are because no one wants yeah. them yeah exactly yeah so that was interesting i thought the actor who played the character of the radio station upperclassman dj was in Glee, but in my research, he's actually an Unreal. So mm. apparently there's more than one attractive blonde Australian actor in Hollywood. Who I like thought? how Anna Camp, just kind of jumping around here, but I like how she's such a nerd about the acapella lifestyle <laughs> that she makes it, I guess, a verb, an adjective. It, Is it... It's a prefix you put in anywhere. Yes. Aka please. I love aka please. She does, I believe, drop an aka bitches in there at some point. Yeah. It's Aka everything, and that's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. She also has turn in your scarf and go, which is a funny line. I will mention also, though, the character of Aubrey, played by Anna Camp, has a couple of incidents with vomit. If people are a little squeamish about that, you uh, should be aware. Going in. There's going to be some puking. (laughs) You've been warned. You have been warned, which I I think, though, the first time happens very early in the film, about four and a half minutes in. And that tells you what kind of film you're in for. It does. It actually does set the stage. Buckle up. This movie was very popular with apparently tween and teen girls. That's why I like it, which is a little bit surprising given the amount of vomiting and kind of a little bit harsh humor that goes on in there. Right. Bumper and Fat Amy have quite a few horrible things to say to each other. And there's some various and sundry, I guess you'd say maybe a little bit risque things, which surprised me that 12-year-old girls would be into it, but apparently they are. They're stretching their wings. (laughs) Yeah. There's a run by burritoing in the film. I was just going to ask you if there was a driving review. These these kind of collide. It does collide. So I will say there's a plot point involving the van after the burritoing that does not ring true to me. And this is a thing I didn't catch until the latest viewing, which I'm certainly in the double digits on this film. Yeah. Is if, in fact, as with your uncle famously, they didn't get fuel in there, there is a fuel warning light that would have come on before the vehicle runs out of fuel. Oh, you're right. Now, this is different, though. What happened to my uncle was they forgot to turn. This is back. Well, I guess this is still true. But they made it harder now. You know how you have to like flip a switch or you turn on the pump, basically. And the person forgot to do that. And so when he put the nozzle in and pulled the thing, like now it would click back. You know, it would kind of alert you that you're not filling up. But back then it didn't do that. And so he thought he had gas and carried on his way. Now, Amy gets distracted quite she aggressively. Does. Right. And she gets a burrito thrown at her. Mm -hmm. And so I think the reason they didn't fill up is just like they didn't realize she hadn't filled up. She gets distracted because she has burrito guts all over her. Correct. And they just go on their way. And a little bit of trivia, when Adam Devine had to throw about five different burritos to try to hit Amy and to have her produce the most disgusted look on her face. And one of the times he accidentally hit the cameraman. Poor camera crew. It happens all the time. Yeah. That, yeah. At least that's what Adam's saying. It was an accident. <laughs> Just kidding. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Jimmy. I think that the low fuel indicator light would have gone on quite a bit before then. However, let's not pick nits. My other automotive nitpick, though, is in the opening scene when the taxi shows up and Becca gets out, she gets her luggage out of the trunk. And you can very obviously see that it's a gray car that had been resprayed poorly to be a yellow taxi. And why they couldn't just get a yellow taxi cab, I don't know. But that was the automotive part. But there is a lot of subtlety that goes into here, even though it's a silly movie with some puns and some burritos and some singing. I really like 
some of the things that Kay Cannon did. So for example, there's the plot line of Benji and magic. And so at the end of the film, when he's actually part of the Troublemakers, he gets to sing the song, I've Got the Magic in Me. So you can see throughout the film, there's magic, right? He's wearing a cape. He talks about doing various close-up magic tricks. And so Benji has this arc of magic. And I bring this up because this, maybe this is obvious to everyone else. But after I had seen it a few times, it began dawning on me, kind of for the first time, like, wait a second, the screenwriter went through and planted all of these things that was leading toward him singing that line. And I think I lose sight of sometimes the fact that it's not written in one pass like I watch it start to finish. Mm -hmm. The person actually, you know, did a lot of this writing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is there's a plot line where Jesse talks about these movies are great. Becca says, oh, they're boring. The guy always gets the girl, which, of course, foreshadows what happens in this film. But one of the films he talks about is Breakfast Club, and Mm -hmm. that comes back. But if you'll remember, what was Breakfast Club about? It was about a bunch of misfits thrown together against their will, finding commonalities together. Mm -hmm. They even play the audio from the end of Breakfast Club, where Anthony Michael Hall's character is talking about, you know, a jock and a loser and all this together. And that's actually, again, it's in the film. That subtlety, I think, is really good because the first time I saw it, it didn't stand out to me. It wasn't so on the nose that I saw it. But then after repeated watchings, you start seeing this, oh, okay, I see actually how this is going. Yeah, I bet Kate Cannon and Mickey Repkin are of the generation where Breakfast Club was kind of, you know, like with us, it defined our kind of high school years. And it was a big pivotal movie for all of us. So it makes sense that it was intentional. And when they're talking about these movies, I have to admit, when Becca says that it's his father because his name is Darth Vader, it's literally Darth Father, that was literally the first time I had ever thought of that. (laughs) Even though I was aware that Vater is father in German, I literally had never thought of that before and felt like a moron. Okay, Rob Lowe, calm down. Yeah. Um, (laughs) It hurt my heart to hear her say that she doesn't watch movies. Like, who doesn't watch movies? Well, Act 1, Becca doesn't watch movies. Act 3, Becca does. Okay. Okay. So she developed. Yeah. So we see her then later on watching the film and she's sniffling and crying. And so again, very brave from Anna Kendrick, very brave performance because she gives us a bit of the ugly cry there. (laughs) Very brave. Very brave. Very brave. Very brave. I mean, she took her clothes off and she gave us the ugly cry. I mean, That's a brave actress. Yeah. So besides Amy getting hit with the burrito, was there any head trauma? Oh, dang. I didn't make note of that. I don't think there was. Well, there is the fight scene with the tone hangers in the lobby. Oh, that's right. That's right. Joe Latrilio gets some nut trauma. So, (laughs) Yes, that's true. There's a mild fight scene and some glass breaking. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's kind of a comical scene. I didn't recognize all of the actors in the tone hangers, but I did recognize Joe Latrulio, who I think is um, quite funny. It's a guy from Scrubs, the black guy from Scrubs. Donald Faison? Yes, is that he's right? one of them. Yeah. 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 So they play has been a cappella singers. Yeah. And w- when do we get our payoff smoochie between Becca and what's his name? Jesse. Smoochie, smoochie, smoochie. One hour, 44 minutes in. Oh, almost to the end. Yes, there is some trouble in paradise before they get there. Yes. So they they make us wait for it. All right. So should we look at the numbers? Sure, let's look at the numbers. Okay. This movie, I before we get into actual numbers, this movie was filmed in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. I thought that was kind of interesting. I it think is. I do remember that Louisiana was a state similar to like Georgia who had some rebates and tax cuts. So that makes sense that they would have picked it just to cut costs. And it was set on a college campus. So it's always crazy to me to have everybody fly there. And if Baton Rouge doesn't have a big film community to support it for like all the crew, how that's cheaper. But movies do it all the time. I'm going to forget which movie it was, but I remember Dax talking about being in a town that was so small that there was just like the hotel and the Applebee's. And so yeah, how is that that's all cheaper? they did. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Great for the Applebee's though. I know. Okay. So speaking of money, the budget was $17 million. They did quite well. <laughs> because yeah. domestically it made $65 million, So it's already a win. Worldwide, they made $115 million on this film. And it's crazy. the album sold gangbusters. Yes, 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 yes. 
Right. So its IMDb score is seven. Rotten Tomatoes gave it at 81% and the audience gave it 83. So this, again, is another popular movie. It tops out at one hour, 52 minutes. It's rated PG-13. Like Mike said, it's a romantic comedy with lots of music. And it was put out by Universal Pictures, as we said before, because of the music licensing yep. i could only think of one pause count like i mentioned when john hickey came on screen i was like john hickey and mike goes how do you know him and so i had to prove my loyalty and give his imdb credits out of my brain right and i only know him from pitch perfect right now for all of you he's in in treatment the new season of in treatment and it's so good was he in like house of cards or one of those kind of political drama things he might have had yeah. My favorite performance, like I said, was the C word or the big C. Mm -hmm. I can't with Laura Linney, I think. Yeah, with Laura Linney, where she has cancer. He plays her brother and they're great together. They're absolutely fabulous. So I remembered that in the last episode, I wanted to talk about all these references that Mike keeps making about trapping people in (laughs) elevators and taking away their devices and creating situations where they can't use their phones. And for those of you who are hiding under a rock or not following us on social Ah. media. Um, (laughs) We made a movie last year and it's about two people get trapped in an elevator and we finished it on Mike's birthday just recently at the end of May and we have submitted it to a ton of festivals. So if you want to know more information about all of that stuff, then go to our Facebook page, Dodge Media Productions. You can get that info from our Instagram Also, you can go to our website, dodgemediaproductions.com, and you can sign up for our newsletter where we will share all of the details of any festivals we get in and the like. Also, I want to remind everybody that you can give us a call and you can leave a message and we might even play it on the podcast. Our number is 971-245-4148, and we would love any questions, any comments, And as a reminder, we're looking for another film about college, like those college years. For September, we are doing some recording and planning because recording time off. There will be episodes in August, but we will not be able to record in August because of so much work and we're going to take a little vacation. So we're already planning for September. So if you have any ideas for a film in September, we welcome that. Also, lastly, we are having a contest in the month of July. If you leave a review or you have left a review, your name will go into a drawing and we will pick somebody and we will pay for one month of streaming service of your choice. So you can pick Netflix, Amazon, Hulu, Paramount, Peacock. They all start with P's. And the fist bump of your choice. Sure. From us? Yeah, I'll give them a fist bump. Well, if they're local. Well, they have to get here. (laughs) Okay. We'll give you a fist bump. Hmm. All right. Thank you, everybody, for listening. That concludes it for Pitch Perfect. Listen next week when we're going to talk about The Greatest Showman, the greatest movie of all time. And never forget. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies. Thanks for listening to Dodge Movie Podcast with Christy and Mike Dodge of Dodge Media Productions. To find out more about this podcast and what we do, go to dodgemediaproductions.com. Subscribe, share, leave a comment, and tell us what we should watch next. Dodges never stop and neither do the movies.